apparently not enough. I think, I think it's close. And she's going to talk for 45 minutes in a mixed manner as it's been happening so far. No? So in principle, it's 25 plus 20, but everybody's interrupting. So. Okay, let's try. <laughs> Shall I, shall I use that one we here as well? No, no, it's fine. Yeah. So, okay, yeah, thank you very much. And uh, thank you to, um, to all the organizers for um, inviting me to this conference. It's really a pleasure to be here at this uh, place. And uh, I think it's an excellent program, so I'm really enjoying it. And uh, yeah, it's great to be here. So I want to um, talk about a topic which is maybe not totally in the scope of this um, conference. I want to talk about uh, colloidal systems which are subject to feedback, to feedback control. And I want to focus on uh, effects which have to do with um, time delay. So let me just um, start with a very rough um, just definition of what we're interested in when we are talking um, about feedback. So the uh, general idea is, and, and this has, been, has a long tradition in engineering, for example, the general idea is that you want to manipulate the uh, dynamics of a system based on information from that system. So for example, one major goal of this feedback could be to stabilize a state, an unstable um, steady or oscillatory state uh, using this um, sort of uh, feedback control. And as I said, this has a um, tradition um, in engineering, but also in uh, laser dynamics, so in laser optical networks, for example, people are using that also in rob robotics, also in quantum systems, so in quantum optics, there are now many nice experiments and also theoretical work where you stabilize or try to stabilize an exotic um, quantum optical state with uh, feedback control. Yeah, um, there's an expert here, and I've given uh, this um, great uh, reference here of uh, John Bechhofer. Uh, we did work in this direction in the context of a, of a joint, a larger scale research project in Germany. So um, now, um, as I said, I mean, this started from more macroscopic systems, these feedback ideas, but um, in the uh, more recently, people started to apply, or not started, they, they do it now for decades already, uh, they use these kind of, more, uh, of methods for small particles um, in a noisy environment, so on colloids, and this is what I want to focus on, and there are also recent developments in the field of active colloids, um, on which we already heard in the last talk, where you have um, colloids or uh, particles more generally with self-propulsion. Okay, so how do you do that in principle? So if you have a colloidal particle or bacterium or something of that size, um, a typical target of control, the typical variable which you would like to manipulate is um, the particle position. And the reason is just that these particles are rather large so you can see them um, by a video camera, for example, and this makes the stochastic particle position or even orientation in some cases, if you have elongated particle, for example, a natural target of this um, control. And there are uh, many nice experiments nowadays. I'm focusing here on experiments on um, active colloidal particles where uh, yeah, which have this um, intrinsic mechanism of propulsion, but there are also many experiments on, on passive system and one a uh, tool to do that, to manipulate uh, the um, colloid particle position is, um, is this optical tweezer um, by which you can uh, yeah, monitor and also, um, and also influence the particle position. So um, now um, a main point in my talk is that, um, at least in some of these experiments, um, there is a time lag between the collection of information and the response to that um, information. And for example, this can be the case because you need some time to image the particle position and to digest the information and feed it back into your equation of motion. And that means that in many cases, you have some sort of, um, of time delay. Yeah? This can be a discrete time delay. It can also be a, a distribution of times. Yeah? I will focus for simplicity on the, on the case of a, sim, a single delay time. But often there will be this, um, this uh, time delay. And uh, traditionally, and this is also, in, for example, with these, in these laser optical networks, often um, this has been considered as, as, as some sort of perturbation, yeah? as something bad, this delay. But um, 
Uh, I think in, in, in many contexts, people now realize that this delay can also have a constructive effect on the dynamics, and we will see one example here today. So, um, yeah, this is a, a more recent experiment from the group of uh, uh, Giovanni Volpe and Lucio Isa. Um, they, have, um, they have used these concepts for an active Janus particle. And here I just show you that as an example that delay plays a role here in this feedback loop. Um, they, have manipul or they have tuned the rotational dynamics, particularly the rotational diffusion constant, based on, an, on a spatial pattern. So using the translational dynamics to tune the rotational dy dynamics, this was the idea here. Okay, so this all looks um, probably quite artificial. These are synthetic colloids and um, artificial feedback loops. But um, of course, we think that um, these delays, delay effects also play an important role if I look to biological systems, if I think, for example, about the delayed response of a bacterium or so to its environment or communication of um, moving um, uh, particles, for example, or birds or whatever. So, so these delay effects um, have some um, importance. Now, um, what, what is interesting, um, or what is interesting to study from a theoretical point of view um, on, the, on these systems, and um, this is a conference where many um, experts on stochastic thermodynamics are present, which is great. Um, so let me just say that, of course, one major issue in this, um, in this area is um, the, yeah, the um, investigation of delayed systems with tools from stochastic thermodynamics. This is not straightforward because you have, obviously, a non-Markovian system. So you have some problems in uh, using the, um, the uh, typical concepts of um, stochastic thermodynamics, for example, if you want to um, formulate an entropy production or so, but there has been some progress in this area and I'm giving some references here. So the general situation you have is, let's say you have um, a particle position which is your control target of a colloid, for example, and this is coupled to a bath, and then there is some sort of controller which I do not really model or define here, um, but which acts at an earlier time, t minus tau, and then, yeah, how do you describe this system thermodynamically? Um, I'm just showing here one result from our own group. This is work together with, uh, was worked together with uh, Zara Loos, who um, also was at the ICTP and is now in Cambridge. With uh, Zara, we started, uh, one, one thing we, start, we, we investigated was the heat flux in such a system. And uh, at that time, we have shown that even if you have only a delay in the system and no other driving force, you can have something like a non-zero heat production in your system. Yeah? So this is quite interesting thermodynamically, and there are more, much more uh, result. Now, in my talk today, I would, um, I do not want to, or, or I uh, do not talk about um, the stochastic thermodynamics. Rather, I want to focus a little bit about um, the, um, the particle dynamics itself. And in particular, what, what interests us are many particle effects. So what happens if you have not only one particle under a delayed force or whatever, but um, many particles, what are, are there any interesting collective properties? Yeah. And this is work uh, done together with um, my PhD student, Robin Kopp at um, TU Berlin. The specific system we are, we, we are studying is a system where um, you have a colloidal particle and later several of them, which are under um, a repulsive time-delayed feedback. Yeah? So often you have an attractive time-delayed feedback, like an optical trap, but here we assume we have some sort of repulsion with time delay, and this can indeed be realized experimentally by optical forces. So we are currently in contact with a group in Niemagen uh, by uh, Roald Dallens, who is doing experiments in this direction, just starting. And um, I, I found a nice example, or heard about a nice example, which is closer to biology. Um, this occurs if you, if you have cells moving over a viscoelastic substrate. So if the cell is migrating, it, um, is, it distorts the substrate. And if the substrate is viscoelastic, has memory effects, then the response of these substrates comes with a delay after the motion of the cell. And that means that the particles uh, create, or these moving cells create some sort of bulge, which at the same time, which pushes them and, 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 and gives some, induces some motion. Yeah? And in fact, um, when we saw this paper here, it turned out that the actual model they used to explain 
their single cell behavior is quite, um, uh, quite similar to um, what uh, we are studying right now with uh, Robin Kopp. So this is um, just our model in, um, for a single particle. So we have overdamped Brownian motion, um, and there's um, a force which comes with a delay time tau. And this force is assumed to be derived from um, just a repulsive Gaussian potential with time delay. Yeah? So the potential is shown here. So you can imagine you have here your particle or cell or whatever, and um, it's, um, it, it basically it carries behind it um, this, um, this repulsive um, potential here, which follows the particle. And the parameters are just, I mean, they are just the parameters of the Gaussian potential. Okay, so there's a time-dependent force pushing the particle, and um, I mean, it's clear it's not so easy to handle this system fully analytically. It's a nonlinear stochastic delay differential equation, what we have here. Stochastic delay differential equations are not easy on their own. There have been some results for linear systems, but the nonlinear case is um, obviously more, more difficult. Uh, for example, if you go towards Fokker Planck uh, descriptions and things like this. Yeah. So, some, uh, if you, so if you want to analyze such a system, it's not uh, straightforward. Um, I mean, you can, can look at the linear limit first. You can linearize this equation of motion. And I think we have seen something similar yesterday um, in the talk of uh, uh, Pascal Martin. And, um, okay, what happens if you have such a particle? This is just position as function of time. And these dashed lines here are the linear behavior, which, which show that the particle is just pushed um, away. And um, this can actually be calculated. Um, but what you already see from here is that the motion differs if you now have a nonlinear uh, potential like this Gaussian repulsion. These are these uh, solid line here, because then it can happen that the particle assumes a constant velocity at, um, at long times. And indeed, this is uh, seen here. Um, now, the nonlinear case, the velocity here, um, what you can show, um, and I've forgotten to say that I neglect noise, it's, this is fully deterministic. Um, is that if the um, combination of feedback parameters is appropriate, that means if my feedback strength is large enough at a given delay time, or vice versa, if my, yeah, my delay becomes l large enough for fixed feedback strength, then this single particle in the deterministic case can get a non-zero velocity um, whose magnitude and also direction become constant deterministically. And this is also a stable state, and it means, so to speak, that these particles align with its own uh, past. Okay, now uh, we wanted to talk about colloidal systems, so there's uh, a noise. And um, here on the left-hand side, you can see the main effect of noise now on the, uh, or, or of the feedback on the uh, trajectories. So black would be the conventional Brownian particle. And now I switch on my repulsive feedback, and what I basically see is that these trajectories become more spread out, which is expected because I have a repulsive force, right? So um, we, um, if you now uh, look at the mean square displacement of this particle, this is, um, this is quite interesting. Um, at, at long times here, this is just diffusion, as you would expect. But at intermediate times here, we see an interplay between diffusive and ballistic motion. Yeah? And these ballistic uh, pieces in the MSD are kind of an, an indirect sign that we have um, um, an effective velocity or some sort of propulsion also in the presence of noise. So I showed you in the deterministic case that there's a clear long time velocity, but this seems to be the case also in, um, uh, in the presence of noise. And to analyze that, we have compared that with an, a system we already heard a little bit about, um, an active particle, here particularly the active Brownian particle. Um, this is a very um, well studied model. Um, here for a single particle overnamed. So uh, we have an equation for the particle position, and there's a so-called heading vector n, which would be this red arrow here, which is due to noise, and, and in 2D, um, the equations of motion look like this. Now for this active Brownian particle, you can, um, you can calculate the MSD analytically, and uh, what we did is we used this analytical formula basically to extract um, um, uh, quantities like propulsion speed or effective propulsion speed and also persistence time for our feedback-driven particle. And then 
Um, what we get out is this one here. So this is just um, obtained by this fit to the active brown and particle. What we see is that if we um, increase the strength of the uh, Gaussian repulsion here, yeah, the strength of my feedback, then both the effective velocity, this is this upper panel, and the persistence time increase as you may expect. What's quite nice here is um, that this effective velocity is, is more or less the same as what you can calculate analytically for uh, the deterministic case. Okay, so uh, essentially to, 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 to summarize that, um, what we have learned or what we have seen so far is that this time delayed repulsive feedback can be seen as some sort of mechanism for persistent motion for um, self-proportion in the system. Now, given this, um, this behavior and also seeing the similarity, at least in the uh, diffusional behavior, to active brown in particles, um, you may ask, okay, what happens if you now have many of these particles? Yeah? Many of these colloids driven by these um, repulsive uh, traps or, um, or yeah, otherwise driven uh, particles. And um, this is what we studied numerically, and I will show that now. The main questions we had were basically inspired by active matter questions. Namely, first of all, do we see any large-scale phase separation, so-called motility-induced phase separation, which is very well known from um, these active brown in particles and related models. And the other question we had was, um, is something interesting happening with the velocities of the particles? And the answer is, of course, yes. Uh, this is why I talk about it. Okay, so um, what we did is just plain um, Brownian dynamic simulations of, um, of uh, uh, this model here. So we have our particles, they are the feedback forces, there's noise. And importantly, the only type of interaction which is important here are steric interactions. Yeah? And we just took a conventional, uh, yeah, typical uh, truncated Leonard Jones potential um, to, to, to model uh, this repulsion here. So there's no interaction between velocities of um, the particles. Okay, so you can simulate this. And uh, as I say, uh, or as I said before, one main question was do we find this motility-induced uh, motility phase separation very well known uh, for the active particles? I'm showing one example here. This, um, on the left-hand side, we have an um, experimental picture um, from the group of uh, Clemens Bechinger. And here is, um, uh, on the right-hand side, these are simulation results uh, from, um, yeah, done together with Hartmut Löwen and, and Thomas Speck. So the idea is, um, is the following, these active brownian particles, uh, they move, they have rotational diffusion, and if you have many of these particles and the propulsion speed is sufficiently high, then they hit each other. They hit each other and it takes some time, if you have two particles, until rotational diffusion um, leads to a reorientation of one particle, let's say this one here. So it takes a while until a particle can leave the cluster, and if you have a sufficiently high density and propulsion speed, then this mechanism, this trapping in clusters, um, leads to a large-scale phase separation. Yeah? This is this motility-induced phase separation, and you can, of course, analyze that. I'm not talk talking about that here uh, further, but this is the main mechanism. So do we have something similar in our system? And um, to, to, uh, to illustrate this, I'm just showing here some snapshots from uh, the simulations which Robin did. We are looking here at a feedback-driven particle, particles, um, many of them, at a pretty high volume fraction, and the feedback is also quite high. We have chosen some value for this uh, delay time. And what we see is um, here is just the passive system. Now, uh, the feedback is switched on. And what happens first is seen here in these upper right plots. What happens first is indeed some sort of clustering. So the particles form clusters. They not only form clusters, but also start to align the, their velocities. But I'm coming back to that uh, later here. So let's first focus on the clustering. Now, the interesting point is if I further progress in time, um, then these clusters dissolve again. And finally, I have something like, which looks very much like a, not completely, but it's a quite homogeneous structure. Yeah? So these, there is clustering in these systems, but it's only transient. And this is very different from um, the conventional active Brownian particle behavior. Here are simulations for a system with comparable parameters at long times, 
Yeah? So this is long time behavior, and we nicely see that this is phase separated. You can quantify that by looking, for example, at a density distribution. Here, this is a distribution of local, den local area fractions, and we nicely see at long times a double peak structure indicating this, um, this behavior here. Okay, so that means from that point of view, um, these feedback driven particles are different. Why is that? This is, would be, by the way, the, um, uh, the distribution of area fraction for our system. So we are starting here from a homogeneous state. Then at intermediate times, we get a very broad distribution. This is this transient clustering. But then um, if we go uh, further in time, the system becomes homogeneous again. So why is that? The mechanism is indeed quite simple. So if you have these feedback-driven particles and this feedback is switched on, then the particles develop persistent motion, they hit each other, they form these clusters, they trap each other. This is quite similar to uh, the active particles. But if we wait longer, then um, the history comes into play. If the displacement of, the, of each particle becomes smaller, then this leads to a reduction of the forces and therefore of the velocities. And so this is where uh, the, the time-delayed feedback comes in. And that means the particles, so to speak, become passive. Yeah? So I first have a, so to speak, active particle, but now the velocity goes down because of this um, hindering, and um, so there's no clustering anymore. They dissolve, and only later we have uh, seen in time that uh, clusters can form and dissolve again. So from that point of view, it's quite different. Okay, so much about the clustering. Um, the more maybe intriguing phenomena in this system is that um, the velocities of the particles uh, tend to align if I go to long times. Yeah? And this is shown here. Um, so we have um, kind of an average velocity. It's a noisy quantity in my overdamp dynamics, but we can still measure it as a function of time. And what we see is that um, at least at strong feedback, um, I see a clear yeah, non-zero global velocity in the system. Yeah? So there's some sort of flocking behavior. And this is also seen from the snapshots. Um, here, um, we clearly see this is the color code that more or less all particles point with a velocity along the same directions. We've also looked at spatial velocity correlations, and you get the same information. Yeah? There's large-scale ordering. I do not really want to, um, or we didn't really analyze, let's say, the, uh, properly uh, the uh, decay of these spatial correlations. So I cannot talk about exponents or so at this time because the simulations are not large enough. But there is, at least on, on this scale, there is a uh, large scale ordering. So, um, and the same happens, of course, also, um, it, it's not an, a singular phenomenon. It also happens at other um, densities and feedback strengths. So here we have, I have a plot of, so to speak, the order parameter. This is average velocity versus or normalized by the velocity a deterministic single particle would, um, would have at these parameters. So we can see that as an order parameter as a function of feedback strength, and we nicely see how it, yeah, at different densities it, uh, it goes up. Um, the smaller the density, the more, the stronger the feedback needs to be to see this effect. By the way, these, um, these curves here somehow indicate that in this dilute system here, there's no velocity ordering, but we found that if you go even further with this A, um, you see again uh, this, uh, this ordering effect. Okay, just at, as an um, intermediate remark, active brown in particles, on which I talk quite a lot, do not show this behavior. So you see in these systems, and these are results from Caprini and, uh, and, um, and uh, uh, his co-workers here, um, so they found a local velocity ordering co um, correlated to motility-induced phase separation, but not a large-scale ordering as we see in our system. Okay, so how can we understand that? And uh, I think there are several pieces in the explanation, so to speak. So first we need to understand why there is even local um, velocity alignment. I mean, Recall that in the equations of motion, there are only steric interactions, but no aligning interactions. Yeah? So what, what's going on here? And the analysis of, well, what, I'm, what I've written down here is, um, is again borrowed from, from this Caprini paper. Um, 
So what, you, what we were looking at, or what we are looking at here, is so to speak the second type or the time derivative of our equation of motion in the deterministic um, case. So just to make things simpler, we have neglected here the noise. And if you do that, you find two terms. One has to do with the feedback force, and the other with this repulsive interaction between um, the particles. So the impact of the feedback we already know. Yeah? So what, what is shown here, I mean, here's a matrix which has to do with the spatial derivative of the feedback. And basically, it, it shows a coupling to the own history. The second thing here uh, is the more interesting um, in our context. So it contains derivatives of the repulsive pair potential. And what you see here is that it couples velocities of neighboring particles. So this is, so to speak, an indirect velocity aligning mechanism if this matrix A is, has positive elements. And it, it, did, it does have positive elements. You can, you can okay, I, I need to speed up, yeah, thanks. Um, it, it, it is positive, so you can estimate that by, by some mean feed argument, but also calculate it. These matrix elements are positive, so that means there's an, there's an kind of aligning effect, yeah? So this maybe explains why there's local alignment um, of the motion of these, uh, of these particles. But the question still is, how, um, how do the particles maintain their alignment at, at large distances, even after interacting? And our idea is that here, again, the feedback, the time-delayed feedback comes in. So imagine you have two particles. They are colliding. They are starting to align. Um, so it will be important that they maintain each particle maintains its velocity direction until it hits another particle. Yeah? So a simple um, yeah, mean field-like argument to estimate this onset of ordering, of large-scale ordering, should be as follows, that you say, OK, the distance traveled in one delay time, which we can estimate like this. This is our delay time, and this is our um, uh, yeah, deterministic velocity, actually, is something like average particle distance, very roughly. Yeah, this is a very rough mean field argument, but if you take that seriously, you can, um, you can come up with a mean field prediction for this onset of ordering. And this works surprisingly well. So here's a state diagram of our numerical data. Everywhere where you see crosses, the system is velocity ordered in the sense I explained before. And this black line here is, um, is our mean field prediction, which gives an, um, I would say, decent um, estimate of um, where this velocity ordering occurs. There's a second length scale which is important when I now look at the noisy system. In the, no the, uh, the consideration so far was deterministic, but now I I'm in a noisy system, so the natural length to look at would be the persistent length. How long does an isolated feedback-driven particle travel before, um, before changing its direction of motion? And uh, this is called the persistent length, which we can calculate by our uh, yeah, mapping to the active brown system. And um, it's actually quite interesting if we use this as an x-axis. So if you plot our order parameter as function of persistence length relative to mean fee, uh, free path, we see that all of the curves at different densities tend to collapse. Yeah? So this seems to be an important quantity in the system. And this is reminiscent um, to the physics of the Witschek model. Yeah? The Witschek model is a paradigmatic model for, for flocking behavior. And for these systems, it's very well known that, um, that um, the, uh, on, so these are simulation results, older one, and this is from, um, uh, uh, yeah, are also simulation results from uh, Yusha T and, and co-workers. Um, so this is the phase diagram, this is noise here in the Witschek model, and this is density. Not sure what happened now. Ah, yeah, noise and density. And you nicely see if the noise becomes low, in our case, that would mean the feedback strength becomes large. Then we, see, we go from a disordered gas to, to uh, something like a flocking state, what is called your polar liquid. Yeah? In fact, in the Witschek model, you also find some intermediate states which are um, not homogeneous in density. And we found similar behavior in our system. Um, these are results for low densities where we find bands, moving bands of particles. Yeah? So it's not homo totally homogeneous anymore, but now we have this formation of bands. We didn't uh, so far really properly investigate it, where these bands occur and where it's homogeneous and all that, 
but it, overall, I think it's quite um, related to, uh, to the system. So with that, um, I would like uh, to conclude. I, uh, I hope I have shown you that this um, time-delayed repulsive feedback can be interesting. I think it's not really restricted to this Gaussian repulsive decay we had so far. What seems to be important is that the force is nonlinear, because if it's not nonlinear, you do not get this long time steady state with the constant velocity. This is important. Yeah? So, but um, it seems to uh, work as an effective propulsion, and we also found some yeah, nice similarities to Witschek um, behavior and also to active brown in particles in terms of these trends and clustering. So, uh, yeah, and uh, the other are just um, some questions maybe um, which, uh, which we find interesting right now. So generally, I think it's, um, I mean, there has been lots of work done on, on single particles with memory or delay, but uh, I think it's a natural question to go towards uh, more particle and uh, collective behaviors here, and there are also some experiments in this direction. And finally, of course, it would be great to come back to uh, the thermodynamic properties of this um, coupled system. Um, as I said, it initially it's already complicated for a single particle with time delay. Yeah? So it's uh, not totally clear how we go to the many particle uh, system. But there are also interesting relations to non-reciprocity, uh, as we believe. And um, this is, I just show that as a final uh, a slide. I do not really want to go through it. But let me just say, say that at least for linear time delayed systems, you can actually map that on a non-reciprocal system with many variables. Yeah? So there's, an, there's a, some connection in this direction. And it has been shown, and this, has, uh, this is work done by Sarah Loos, that already if you model this time delayed feedback very similarly, uh, very simply by just taking a, a, a few number of hidden variables here, you already get very interesting thermodynamics. And I think it would be worthwhile to um, extend these studies to coupled systems. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sabina. Any questions? Who wants to start students first? OK, I'll go here first. One here as well. Hi. Yes. Hi. Yes. Ah, oh, sorry. <laughs> so it's, it's interesting because it seems that there is no area of fraction below which it doesn't work, this transition from fluid to solid like motion. Yeah, that's an interesting question. I mean, it's um, the smallest packing fraction we were looking at here in the simulations is um, yeah, 0.1, which is a dilute system, but it's still finite. Coming from the physics of the Witschek model, you would expect that at any finite density, ordering occurs as soon as these persistent lengths becomes large enough to overcome the mean particle distance, which, of course, is, is, is huge if you, if you go to the limit uh, road to zero. Thank you. Hi. Here, on your right. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, hi. Um, uh, yeah, thanks for the very interesting talk. So, uh, uh, so you mentioned that in lower backing fractions, you need to go to larger repulsions, uh, yeah. larger time delayed repulsion in order to have similar yeah. effects. So ha have you thought about um, making an effective particle diameter, like, like some, some sort of density-dependent effective particle diameter that would explain these observations? I mean, I think, uh, I think an explanation is already given by this mean feed prediction, mm -hmm. where we compare the distance traveled by a particle in one delay time approximately. I mean, this is an estimate by the mean particle distance. This is a very simple, it's <laughs> embarrassingly simple argument in a way, but it seems to, expl seems to explain at least some features. Okay. Yeah. Hi, um, thank you for the very nice talk. So I had a question about uh, when you observe a cluster, so when you have MIPS. So what I was wondering is, do you observe some sort of oscillations between, uh, so you have clusters, then yeah. they homogenize, then they, you have formation of clusters again, is yeah. something this um, If you look at this plot, the bottom plot, this shows these, okay, it's a little bit indirect, these matrix elements of this matrix A here, which has to do with steric repulsion. So it's an indirect measure of how close the particle come each other. Yeah? 
as function of time. And you see here these oscillations. They have approximately a, the frequency of one delay time. Yeah? So in, in the end, what you can think of the particle cluster and dissolve again, and, and, and the, uh, the time scale is given uh, roughly by the delay time as expected in a way. I mean, we know that this um, delay induces oscillations already in single particles if you look at correlation functions. Yeah? Thanks. And this, um, on, on, in this many particle picture, it, has, it seems to also govern the, the cluster formation and dissolution. Something here. Ah, sorry, yeah. <laughs> so your, your comment about the uh, uh, time delayed feedback being as a mechanism for propulsion, that's rather interesting. So I wonder what is the equilibrium limit other than taking the time feedback to zero? Can I get an equilibrium uh, limit for a single particle, say with some Markovian, non-Markovian noise? Or is there no way I can? I mean, if you, if you look at the system from, I mean, this is already a nonlinear system, so it's a little bit difficult. If, let, let's say we, we take the linear case, yeah? Uh -huh. Um, it turns out that at any finite delay time, you have a non-equilibrium system in okay. the sense that it has a an, an, an finite heat production, for example. Correct. This Correct. is known, I, I didn't give the, uh, the references here, but this is, this is known already for quite a long time. So it's, okay. you can, it depends a little bit on how you define equilibrium. So the heat, the heat flow, for example, is always non-negative, but there they are singular points where it's, where it's zero. If you talk about when, for example, is the FDT ful fulfilled or not, there are points in parameter space where you can realize, I mean, we, we tested that when, when modeling this feedback with some auxiliary or hidden variables. Mm -hmm. And there you can find conditions where the FDT is uh, fulfilled, singular conditions, I would say. And there's not a consequence that you start with the old amped equation. I mean, if I had inertia, I would no, still we, have the same no, problem. I, I mean, the, the behavior in the inertial case is, is quite uh, is quite similar. At least from for the for the systems we have been studying, I would I'm confident to say that. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for the nice talk. Um, so you've sh shown that the, this global velocity ordering is already present at the low density, but yes. at low density you don't have, I think, uh, uh, this transient uh, space separation, right? Um, yeah, it depends on how you call it. I mean, it's, um, so thanks for the question. <laughs> uh, so what we see is the, sorry, I, uh, the smaller the density, the more likely becomes this, what we call band formation. But and this is also seen in the Switchek model. Yes, yeah, sir. But this is, uh, I mean, this happens after the formation of the global velocity ordering. It goes together. It goes hand in hand. I, so my understanding but is first the particles start to become close, not necessarily trapped, trap, but they get close. And then this velocity alignment sets in. But you need, a, you need something like a nucleus okay. to go on. And then after some time, I mean, this is already at a later time here, you have these bands or even, even thinner bands at, at smaller densities. And in these bands, I mean, the structure is, again, more or less homogeneous. Yeah? But you need, so, so to speak, a, a nucleus of, of particles. And of course, this is getting more difficult if I go to really low densities. Yeah, so I was wondering, is it also experimentally feasible or theoretically you can analyze when you give the feedback not on the conservative force, but say on non-conservative force, or even on kinetic parameters. Like, I mean, can you imagine that you give feedback via changing mobile, um, frictions or diffusion constants? Has, has this been making any sense? I mean, it's, um, what people have done is, for example, looking at um, feedback in the, in the interactions. In the, directly in the particle interactions. This is what for, for the Witschek model, for example, this, this has been done. Yeah? Um, you could do that. I'm not a, I, I have to say, I, I do not know whether this has been done or not. Yeah? I mean, it's, um, of course, if you, I mean, if, if you talk about, I mean, you can rewrite these equations in, 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 in some cases in terms of something which looks a little bit like a generalized Langevin equation, and then you would have a kind of memory which has this feedback incorporated in some cases. Yeah, from that point of view, yes, but kinetic parameters, mass or so, I'm not sure.
Hi. Um, yeah, it was, it was very nice. Um, I was wondering, I was trying to understand better this orientation alignment. Um, <coughs> can, would it be equivalent to something like if I just look at uh, two body collisions? I think I need both hands, but imagine you have one velocity here, yeah. the other is coming in from, from uh, uh, four pi star radians, and then you look at the distribution of, of relative velocities going out, and it's, it's something different from uniform. Would that? Yeah. Um, I think it's related. I mean, it, so, so maybe I, 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 I didn't, didn't exactly understand what you mean. So, so, it's, so you have two particles colliding and you're asking for the time scales? Is that the point? Or? Uh, no, no. So the, um, I'm just trying to figure out, because you, you gave an explanation in terms of this, this interaction kind of matrix, which yeah. for me was hard to understand physically. And I was just trying to imagine, like, would, ah, would you see it reflected in, like, the... the relative orientations of two particles after That's an interesting point. Before. Yeah, uh, this is, um, um, I think what, what should be done is, for example, to, to really look at the non-equilibrium correlation functions. There we should see it. I mean, we, 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 we know, for example, for the MIPS, for this phase separation, it, it's absolutely clear, you can see it in the pair correlation function that, part, uh, that this trapping can be seen that there's a higher probability for another particle to be in front of my active particle than behind. And this is crucial to explain the, this effect. And I think similarly, one could look here at the local distribution, orientation distributions around a particle. Would be very helpful, I guess. Yeah, should be reflected in quantities like this. Hello, I, I wanted to ask um, a question. Um, you, well, this is a feedback model, right? Uh, since you said that decreasing displacement creates decreasing yes. velocity. My understanding is this is a positive feedback loop? It depends on, on how you define it. Uh, I mean, positive or negative. It, it is a feedback loop, right? I mean, if I... If I, um, it is a, I mean, it's like a, a destabilize, destabilizing feedback loop. In, not this, a, in this not sense, yes. In this sense, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here we go, yeah. Yeah, yeah. In this sense, yes. Yeah, if you decrease... Um, I mean, at some point, if you, um, uh, um, yeah. Hi. Uh, wonderful talk. Does this cluster size or bands that you form at low, distri at low, at low densities follow any kind of distribution, like power low? Or yeah, should be, should be, uh, that should be done. Uh, what I mean, let's say, based on the experience of Vitchek model simulations, it took a, like a decade or so to really figure out, yeah, all that. I mean, is it first or second order? What are the what are the exponents and all that stuff? So you need much larger system sizes and much longer simulations. Yeah, I would Thanks. say I cannot really comment on that. It should be done. No more questions. So if there's no more questions, let's thank our speaker again. Thank you.